think that uh, we still need some of the panelists. Uh, we have the <laughs> pleasure of having Mr. Nemitz uh, here, but uh, I think that uh, we expect some more panelists. Please, gentlemen, take seats. Uh, we switch immediately to the next topic. I understand that uh, it has been uh, quite uh, uh, often mentioned uh, during the first uh, uh, panel and the first part of the debate. And this is how the cloud uh, computing uh, 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 relates with uh, issues of, uh, of security, of data privacy, of protection, etc., etc. And I think that uh, uh, given the technologies are already uh, in place and the knowledge about the uh, benefits of using uh, cloud computing uh, are becoming more and more uh, uh, available to uh, different stakeholders, being uh, uh, companies, including small and medium-sized enterprises, public authorities, municipalities, etc., etc. Uh, if there is uh, one thing which is very often mentioned. This is uh, the issue of uh, security and the reliability of the data. Um, very, uh, the issue of, of cloud computing is discussed at, uh, at uh, many, uh, many events. Uh, I have the impression that uh, when speaking with uh, especially small and medium-sized companies and with uh, uh, public authorities, uh, they are absolutely uh, convinced that uh, cloud technologies uh, would bring really a revolution into, into their work and they have a much more accessible uh, technological uh, achievements uh, at a much lower price. Uh, but the problems uh, that are very often uh, put, this is uh, what is the security of the, uh, of the data, how we can enforce the legislation uh, which exists, is the legislation covering uh, uh, all the aspects and uh, can we feel safe when uh, we, we store data or when we use uh, software and, uh, and other products on the cloud. Uh, and uh, there is a concern with the uh, providers of, uh, of internet because uh, there are many uh, institutions that uh, uh, are still uh, speaking about uh, uh, the availability of broadband and the reliable internet service. We shall leave this latest part apart, uh, apart because this is, uh, this is going to be uh, discussed further and uh, we shall concentrate uh, in this panel about the, uh, on the issues uh, related to the security and to the safety of the data. Uh, what can be done, what is not done, what are the challenges and I think that we have an excellent uh, panel here today uh, and uh, uh, the panel is going to give us the opportunity to uh, really uh, listen to the different uh, standpoints. Uh, we have uh, uh, for the moment at the, pa at the panel two uh, gentlemen that uh, are uh, supposed to provide the cloud to, to the cloud uh, uh, services, uh, to expand the cloud services. Uh, this is uh, Jeff Brugman from uh, AT&T uh, and I'll uh, go to present uh, into a bit more details in a while. The, uh, panelists, and uh, this is also uh, Tom, uh, Thomas Anders, uh, who is going to come, who is uh, uh, CEO of Lutzhansa, but uh, we have here on the panel uh, Gerald Hubner, uh, who is uh, working for SAP, one of the largest uh, European company uh, providing IT solutions. So they are on the site of the technological instruments and means. Uh, we have two uh, very notorious representatives from the other side, from the side of the institutions that uh, are called to protect the data and to uh, watch that uh, the privacy of information is enforced and that uh, the data is uh, properly uh, protected. Uh, this is Mr. Uh, Mr. Peter Hastings, uh, who is uh, the European uh, Data Protection uh, Supervisor, and uh, Mr. Paul Nemitz, uh, who is the Director uh, of fundamental rights and citizenship in DG justice uh, uh, in the European Commission. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we went, wait for another pa panelist, Mr. Thomas Anders, Andres, who is CIO of Lufthansa. Uh, he is going, he just informed that he's going to come, but uh, maybe at the end of the panel. 
maybe it has to do something with the strikes in Lufthansa and the decrease of the, uh, of the flights. But uh, I hope that he is going to get through and join us uh, before the end of the panel. Uh, so without uh, further uh, speaking uh, in the opening, I would like to give the floor to the panelists. Uh, again, uh, since we are a little bit uh, behind the schedule, we shall try to have uh, a concise uh, um, uh, panel so that we can uh, have the time for, uh, for uh, uh, an appropriate discussion. I would like uh, to ask the panelists to speak about six, seven minutes uh, each as an introductory uh, so that uh, we have the possibility afterwards to have a, a discussion and uh, finish more or less on time. Uh, without uh, further delay, I would uh, uh, like to start uh, by uh, giving the floor to uh, Mr. Gerald uh, Hubner, who is uh, the Chief uh, Product Security Officer of uh, SAP. Uh, again, one of the largest European, maybe the largest European uh, IT uh, company. I can give you this microphone also if you, if so, you need. Okay. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And to cut the long story short, yes, the cloud is safe, right? So that's it? No. Um, let's talk about it, why, <laughs> why it really is. Reminds me of somebody saying, so there are so many British people, British beef is safe. I remember that. But no, the cloud really uh, has some benefits. So are my slides up there? So maybe a little introduction. My name is Gerald Hübner. I work for the uh, SAP company in based in Waldorf, Germany, so we are real Europeans, and we have our cloud in Europe, based in Germany, the data center is based in Germany, so we actually are Europeans. We, we are delivering cloud services under German-European data protection law, and it's possible, as you can tell. So we, we have a huge cloud up there, and yes, it's safe. So when, when you push the button and move, move to the first slide, so what, what I want to say is everybody's talking about the benefits of cloud. So there are huge opportunities for cloud providers. Uh, potential revenue growth is predicted. Uh, so a lot of people have already said that. Then there is probably uh, a gain for carbon footprint reduction, reduction and, and all that kind of and environmental protection uh, issues with the cloud and significant impact on, on job creation as well. However. Um, when you look at the user benefits, it's not only uh, lower cost and enhanced uh, flexibility and, and focus on the core competencies because especially SMEs want to do business and uh, not waste their time by trying to administrate complicated information technology in, in a very sufficient way. The cloud makes that a lot easier and that's why I'm saying that's uh, one of the benefits the cloud really can deliver is enhanced security. That might sound a little well, unfamiliar when somebody says that who's involved into privacy and security for years. I've been, by the way, um, how, how did you say that? One, the, the other notorious players from, from government who take care of privacy. So I actually was one of them in my former life as a privacy officer working for the German government. But now I'm on the other side and I can say, well, you know, um, it's, it's our responsibility, of course, to make sure that cloud services are offered in a secure manner. It's, it's in the interest of the cloud provider themselves, of course, to do that, not only for liability reasons, but there's actually no other way you can sell your services uh, other than in a really secure and privacy compliant manner, of course. We know that, everybody knows that, and, and that's why uh, the market really has um, regulative function in order to, to really make that happen, and it's possible to make it happen. And when you think about, when you, when you push, push the button, um, there are, of course, a, a, lot, of, a lot of discussions uh, about why people don't move into the cloud. And this has a lot to do with perceived uncertainties about privacy and security. But who really knows how privacy and security is done in huge data centers with professional people at large cloud suppliers. So SAP doesn't only do the cloud, we, we do on-premise software as well. We, we are a software company, the biggest uh, European software vendor, like you said, that's absolutely right. We are uh, a global player based in Europe. Um, and when you know what SAP really does, we have around 150,000 customers worldwide. They're really the biggest ones in the enterprise. And it's a very responsible I'm jo a job I'm holding there when you think about 80% 
of the world's beer production relying on SAP. So we really have to make our software reliable and secure, you bet. Uh, so we know that, and we definitely do that. So delivering cloud services have to have, of course, meet this really high standard we usually always have uh, with respect to the security and availability of our products and services. Uh, so the, the trust question um, that a lot of times arises, where is my data? And of course, that is a valuable discussion uh, to have, and it's really understandable, of course, for customers to ask, where is my data? And I, I personally think it's um, necessary, of course, to give this answer. Um, it's, it's quite easy to say, well, we are on the cloud. There are several data centers interconnected worldwide, and I don't really know where your data is. However, sometimes customers do demand, but I really want my data to be based in Germany or in Ireland or wherever it is, in Europe, and want to make sure that it's not transmitted without me knowing it or against my will to some other entity worldwide or so. In, in this case, it should be definitely possible to say, yes, we we can tell you, yes, uh, your data is stored, for example, if you want to, in Germany or in some other data center, even though there might be issues with scaling, then it might not be possible to offer the service at the same cost level. However, it should be possible for somebody who really has that requirement and really wants to do that. And then there is this, and you probably all know what I mean when I say that this Patriot Act uh, discussion, where you have the issue that colliding jurisdictions uh, assume the right to uh, grab data that is based in, an, in another jurisdiction, not caring about uh, if providing this data would violate um, legal aspects in some other country. However, that's a political issue, and I think it's very hard for uh, a private entity like SAP or any other private entity to solve this problem. And um, I can just... Um, ask the political level to take care of that, to make sure that if we all want cloud computing to be on a trust level where everybody says, yes, uh, we want to use the benefits of professional people um, running cloud services in a secure data center to be able to, uh, to benefit from, from this opportunity instead of having to worry about Patriots Act discussion or any kind of discussion like that. Uh, the issue is there, it needs to be solved, but should be and needs to be solved on the political level. It, I personally think it might not even be able to solve it on the legal level just by putting some provisions in, in the new data, uh, data protection um, regulation. Um, might not be sufficient, but that's something we can and, and should, of course, discuss. And I'm pretty sure Peter knows much, much more about this issue and has, has dealt with it more than we have. We are trying to actually avoid it, of course, because it's it's not something that happens when you consider millions of people being in the cloud with everybody of them every day. This, this is a side issue, actually, when you, when you look at how things are really going in reality. So when you push the button, please. So I, I just want to show you real quick, because then I think seven, six or seven minutes are over. Why is cloud computing uh, secure? Because when you look at typical SMEs, it's hard for them to get the knowledge uh, and keep the knowledge up to, to maintain a secure IT environment. It's costly, it's not easy to do. And when you look at cloud computing, you usually have huge data centers with lots of uh, professionally managed processes by professional people who know that stuff, which usually gives, uh, gives you uh, a lot of advantage compared to what usually can be done with um, lots of effort individually. So having things done by professional people in a professionally run data center uh, gives you just much better physical security or a backup and recovery. And by the way, uh, when you do backups, and when, when you look at a typical SME, they even might do backups, but my experience is when it comes to recover the backup, has, everybody even, have, has anybody even tried to do that? Because that's really the hard thing. Uh, only believe somebody who says, I have a backup, you know, that really works when you've tried to recover it because that's where the issues are. In a professionally run data center, of course, that's every day's business to exercise and make sure it really, really works. Uh, and when you come to uh, unspeakable scenarios where you think, no, it can never ever happen, just think about Fukushima. Yes, it might make sense you know, to have your data um, 
start redundantly in a separate geographic region. And, and we all know something that could not have happened did happen. So when button one more time, I'll show, show you some uh, pictures about on a data center based uh, near Waldorf in, in Germany where our production is for our cloud services. What you see the fully monitored DAWs and security policy support 24 by 7, something that for uh, small and medium sized companies, of course, is hard to do. So beneficial, of course, to, to do it with the scalability effect in the cloud adds to security a lot. So hundreds of uh, UPS diesel fuel storage for 48 hours uh, and an ongoing, um, of course, redundant and environmentally friendly fire extinguishing systems. All that kind of stuff is extremely expensive and, and very hard uh, to do individually just for a small company. In the cloud, because of the scalability effects and the professionally managed huge data centers, that's much more easily possible. So. Um, I, I hope I, I could make you think about security really being there in the club, but there's one more aspect. One more aspect is about, can you push the button please? One, one more aspect is about when you start to build a cloud, you, you need to do it with secure products off the scratch, because if you don't start building secure products where uh, privacy enhanced technology, technology that makes, makes sure that you, you can meet privacy requirements off the scratch and all these things, when they are not built in from the scratch, it's very hard to run that software and, and to, uh, to deliver secure services uh, based on that software. And that's why uh, I really emphasize that it's absolutely necessary to have something like a product innovation life cycle or pro uh, product security life cycle or whatever it is called. Uh, large companies like SAP or, or Microsoft and other big players, hopefully, well, I know that we and Microsoft has them and hopefully others as well, um, but it's really necessary to have these professional standards in place uh, because if you don't run the cloud on secure software, it's, it's really hard or it's even impossible uh, to deliver it in a secure way. But this is something we can do because off the scratch, we, we build our software with professional security development lifecycle processes um, with security and privacy built in. And that ensures high product quality and at the end high quality of services delivered on the basis of that software. And at, at the end we're a software company. Soft, so cloud services are based on software, so you need to use uh, well-built, secure, reliable software to deliver these services. Thank you very much. I also thank you very much, uh, uh, Daryl. Uh, I would like to ask a uh, representative for another ICT, large ICT company from across the Atlantic, uh, Jeff Brugman, to uh, make his presentation. Jeff is uh, Vice President of Public Policy and Deputy Chief Privacy Officer of at and uh, uh, the person who is in charge of introducing new type of services, including cloud computing. So I, I guess you know the challenges very well. You have the floor, Jeff. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. And oftentimes, I've done a lot of cloud computing panels, and we talk about privacy and security from the standpoint of consumer services, and particularly, oftentimes, free or low-cost services provided over the internet. But uh, as Ger Gerald was saying, for AT&T and our customers, um, we think of cloud as a much broader set of services. Uh, and we have almost four million business customers of all sizes that are increasingly using various types of cloud services. This ranges from uh, governments and, and large enterprises uh, that want to use uh, either private cloud services or sometimes hybrid solutions with a high level of security and management to small and medium businesses who are increasingly uh, have mobile services and, and low cost cloud services as the core of their business. And I would echo some of what Gerald said is I think we actually have a lot that we can learn about improving security and privacy from what we see some of our business customers doing and that may be helpful in some of the policy discussions that we're having as well. So I'd like to frame the issue in terms of three broad trends uh, that we think um, cloud computing is often uh, an umbrella term for and the first is obviously businesses are going virtual and that means they can uh, take advantage of um, hosted uh, data storage, they can have hosted applications, and they can also 
um, get on-demand computing in ways that reduce costs and provide additional flexibility. And what we're seeing is there's not one size fits all for the type of virtualization that business customers want to do. And I want to use healthcare as an example of the full range of, of powerful capabilities that cloud computing can offer in a way that preserves security and privacy. If you think about healthcare, it's a very challenging environment as a service provider because you have um, very uh, data intensive medical imaging that require enormous amounts of storage and that doctors need to be able to get access to um, from a variety of locations. You have very sensitive private healthcare records that increasingly we're trying to uh, promote the development of healthcare information exchanges where this information can be shared in a very secure environment. And then increasingly we have, uh, as was referred to in the earlier panel, uh, with the Internet of Things, remote healthcare services with devices generating a large amounts of health information as well. And all of these types of services are enabled by the cloud. And what we are finding is that we have to think about new ways to preserve the security and privacy that are essential for healthcare. So one of the things that we're doing, for example, is developing platforms that can uh, enable authentication, encryption, and, uh, and logging to preserve the highest levels of security while also enabling the sharing of information. And in some cases, that means that we're not creating new databases or creating redundant sources of information, but we're finding ways to allow doctors to share information um, on a common platform while leaving your information records with your doctor in one place. And so uh, another um, healthcare facility may get viewing access to that data, but new copies of it won't be generated, uh, which helps to preserve security. Now all of this is being done in, a, in what must be a low cost environment that um, obviously reaches the farthest uh, geographic areas of, of wh whichever service territory we're uh, serving, and 70% of our healthcare facilities are, would be considered a small or medium-sized business. So this truly must be an affordable, low-cost option with sometimes limited broadband capabilities. And I think that shows the great flexibility that, uh, that the cloud computing platform can provide. Uh, it also provides an interesting model for what might help to improve consumer security. So if you think about the current situation today where consumers are posting uh, a lot of their personal information on various websites and various cloud type services to take advantage of the sharing and the storage capabilities. Um, you can also think about a different model where you may be able to have a more secure type of uh, storage for your, for your data and be able to provide viewing rights to your family and friends to that while retaining the essential control of it. So again, uh, cloud computing is not just one model or one type of architecture, but actually um, can, be, can be used to improve uh, consumer privacy on the internet. Obviously with the, uh, with the proliferation of online services, we have some unique issues about do customers really understand and consumers really understand the implications of what's happening as they're putting their information into these cloud services. And obviously the portability issues that the earlier panel talked about is going to be a critical part of retaining <laughs> the essential control of the data. But there may be different ways to architect some of these services to even enhance the the privacy and security of, of the data management for the consumer. Second big trend, obviously, is that businesses are going global. Um, we know that uh, multinational corporations have had a global footprint, but even small and medium businesses increasingly are having some type of, of global aspect to their business, whether it's just having a website, having a major customer that's um, you know, some, located somewhere else internationally, or finding new markets, um, oftentimes through the internet, to uh, have more of a global presence. So for us, increasingly, cross-border data flows are an inherent um, prerequisite to having uh, the cloud services that our customers want. And oftentimes, we have a vision of a cloud of all data going back to one centralized location, but that's, that's really not how it works in practice. Our cloud architecture is very distributed and localized so that companies can take advantage of uh, wh whichever um, type of access meets their needs best, which in some cases is having data um, closer to the endpoint. So this means that there is a, uh, an extremely large amount and growing amount of traffic that is traversing national borders. And um, as, as Gerald touched on, I think it's very important that as we think about data privacy and security solutions, we think about them in terms of making, uh, creating more interoperable global standards for these types of 
issues that don't lead to new barriers being imposed on cross-border data flows because it's not just important for the service providers like AT&T, but it's incredibly important for our customers. If they're not able to, um, to move data across borders, it's going to dramatically slow down um, the, the growth of the online services and the markets that companies are increasingly finding worldwide. And I've seen a lot of estimates about the rapid growth of cloud computing, you know, reaching 50, 80 billion dollars in the next few years. I actually think that understates the opportunity because that may be just the pure um, cloud computing as an alternative to some of the traditional software and computing services. But I think as the fundamental platform, cloud is enabling a much broader uh, amount of growth around the globe. And that includes dealing with, um, I think, increasingly security issues. Uh, where we see governments uh, reacting sometimes with local storage requirements because they're concerned that if the data is leaving the national borders, they may somehow uh, lose control of it. So would strongly support that we find ways to make the um, government to government uh, law enforcement cooperation work more seamlessly so that uh, countries feel more comfortable allowing cross-border data flows and don't feel compelled to to erect those types of barriers. Obviously, we're also worried about some economic motivation for those types of barriers as well. The third big issue, obviously, is that businesses are going mobile. As, as we all know, consumers are going mobile too, but more and more of our businesses are cutting the cord and moving almost completely to a mobile environment. And cloud is the facilitator for being able to offer those types of services. As Gerald said, there are a lot of benefits that we can offer as a cloud provider in terms of the expertise and the resources that we bring to bear when we're hosting information or applications on our network. But the benefits of the cloud, I think, go deeper than that for security. If you think about the ability to have redundant uh, backups and other types of storage capabilities like that, that is extremely valuable to a small business, particularly when you're uh, using mobile services. And we're also finding that we can add an extra layer of security in the network, particularly for mobile services. So if you think about your home computer and the challenges that all of us have in keeping our um, antivirus software up to date and uh, keeping the threats away from our computer, um, the benefit of having a layer of network-based security is uh, hopefully stopping the threats before they even get that far. So we believe that that's going to be one of the major growth areas for us is providing mobile levels of security. Um, this is particularly important for businesses because, uh, as we most of us know from personal experience, we're increasingly bringing mobile devices to the workplace that aren't within the control of our company's security policies. So as, as we're all wrestling with the impact of the consumerization of IT services, uh, all of the protections that businesses have worked so hard to establish are kind of flying out the window as consumers are, as, as employees are using mobile devices. So the other benefit of this approach is to get all the, the advantages of mobility, but within the safety of, of, of your corporate firewall. And this is something that I think is going to be attractive for both small and medium businesses. So obviously the policy challenges for consumers, I think, run deeper than for businesses. But there's a lot that we can learn about how businesses are using cloud services to think about how to address privacy and security for consumers. And I believe that if we have the right transparency and the right understanding that increasingly there's going to be a market for um, companies that can offer those types of secure services for consumers as well. And with the addition of uh, capabilities such as identity management and um, the, the other extra layers of features and functionalities that can be facilitated through com cloud computing, we actually can envision um, even more robust consumer services that may help to pull us through what is a very challenging time for consumers right now, trying to navigate all of this endless amount of choices and, and the uh, services where they're distributing their data online, and think about maybe a more um, a set of services that actually may work much better for them. So I hope that helps frame some of the policy discussion that we're going to have today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Your place has been taken uh, the time you were speaking. Uh, it happens we already have uh, among us, uh, uh, yes, we already have among us uh, uh, Thomas uh, Andres. That means that Lufthansa is uh, performing excellent at this moment. 
Uh, so uh, I, I really think that uh, I see that uh, the, the, the cloud issue uh, still needs some more time to, 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 to explain the benefits of that. I would like, uh, however, to ask the speakers to stick to a shorter presentation because uh, we started late and uh, I would not like that we take too much from the next panel's time. Uh, I give the floor now to uh, Paul Nemitz. We move to uh, representatives from the, uh, uh, he is director of uh, civil rights in the, in the European Commission with a large experience in the, uh, at the European Commission, a specialist in comparative uh, law. So uh, he's the one to tell us why cloud computing cannot uh, develop immediately. No, absolutely not. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the honorable member uh, uh, made a joke here. I think uh, the commission is convinced that cloud computing is uh, very important uh, for economics. And uh, indeed, I think we are doing the utmost to make its uh, development possible. Um, certainly uh, not all the data which is stored in the cloud is subject to privacy laws. There's much data which is not relevant to the individual. We have Lufthansa here. If uh, you are calculating your timetables uh, on the cloud, uh, the area which I'm interested in, uh, which is uh, privacy protection, data protection, is probably not relevant. Um, also, um, um, sorry to have to contradict the honorable member once more, uh, the, job, the, the job of the commission <laughs> and also my job is not only to protect fundamental rights but also to make the internal market work and to give a boost to growth. Uh, after all, um, uh, the rules on uh, privacy in our reform proposals of 25th January of this year are part of integral part of the digital agenda. So uh, we believe we have uh, lowered the barriers of transfer internationally. We're making uh, transfers more easy. We're stabilizing the relationship between the controller and, and the processor of data. And most importantly, we lay down one regime of law in a regulation, which uh, brings the stability uh, and foreseeability uh, to the operators of uh, uh, cloud and, in, in fact, uh, also beyond that, or to, to all who deal with uh, uh, private data um, um, and beyond uh, borders. Let me say a word on uh, global interoperability. I think we fully share the view, uh, what we have heard from, from the colleague of AT&T. Um, we are in very active dialogue uh, with many partners around the world, with the OECD, but also, of course, in particular with the United States. I've spent myself four days in Washington last week. We had very interesting discussions there. Uh, with the U.S. Administration, uh, Department of Commerce, the White House on the one hand, but also the Federal Trade Commission uh, on the other hand, which is of course an independent body, as you know, uh, in the United States enforcing consumer rights. And I did actually ask on the panel, my co-panelists from the United States, do you think we need special rules for the cloud in terms of privacy as distinct uh, from the general privacy rules? And uh, Cameron Carey, the uh, general counsel of the Department of Commerce, uh, brother of uh, the famous Senator Carey, uh, very clearly said no, we don't think that's necessary. And uh, Mrs. Mittal from the FTC, uh, the deputy director there for privacy enforcement, also said no, actually we are applying, I think, the law of 1938 on consumer protection. Uh, we are applying it to the internet and we will also apply it to the cloud. And um, so I think that is an interesting uh, feedback uh, from the United States, I would think that the view of the European Commission is very much the same. Uh, uh, we believe the general rules on privacy, which we're updating now in view of the digital realities, uh, they can perfectly um, um, also apply uh, to the cloud and they will provide the environment, cloud uh, users, uh, cloud uh, providers, and users both from the business sector but also from uh, uh, points of view of individuals, uh, need uh, to fully make use of the benefits of the cloud as, as they have been outlined here. A final word on uh, uh, these uh, law enforcement issues. I think they're not only Patriot Act issues. Um, I know that uh, many uh, companies actually actively review uh, uh, police law, human rights law, and the protection of their data uh, before they build a data center, whether for cloud or other purposes because they want to be sure, for example, that in the Middle East, you know, in the Arab Spring, the alias 
uh, of people when they use email is not lifted. And uh, companies have come to me and said, you know, there are certain locations in the world where we certainly will never build a data center. So I think our understanding of the situation right now is that for investments in the hardware, uh, which is necessary, and we have seen some uh, uh, very solid examples here from uh, the country I know best, um, uh, the investments in the hardware um, uh, certainly follow the rule, location matters. And we do indeed believe that Europe becomes much more attractive uh, with the reform of data protection as we are putting it forward, because we are providing an environment here which will be a trusted environment. And we believe that, uh, and this is based on empirics, that one of the key impediments uh, to the development of uh, the digital economy generally, but in particular also to usage of cloud, is the lack of trust in how data are being dealt with, private data, but also other data. And we want to remove this lack of trust to the benefit of business. So from that point of view, we believe indeed that with the reform of data protection as we've proposed it on 25 January, Europe will be a prime location to invest uh, for such services and then to provide them worldwide to those who require uh, uh, privacy. Um, and um, that's uh, the proposition which I wanted to share with you and test with you uh, in this audience and uh, I invite you very much uh, to feedback either orally or by doing your investments in the cloud in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nemitz. I, uh, I really have to say that uh, the Commission is uh, working very actively on the cloud and we shall have the pleasure to listen to Commissioner Nelly Cross uh, a little bit later. And I'm sure that she's going to uh, explain uh, how the Commission is going to, even earlier than expected, present the cloud computing uh, strategy, which is going to be very important and I hope it's going to boost uh, uh, cloud computing. Uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Peter Hastings. Uh, he's the guardian of, uh, of personal data in the European Union uh, for a second term now, before that uh, uh, being the guardian of the Dutch personal data. Uh, so somebody who knows very well how data should be preserved. You have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first, it is important to realize that data may be in the cloud, services may be in the cloud, but all the stakeholders are on the ground. The uh, cloud provider is on the ground, the uh, user is on the ground, and certainly all those whose data are being processed are on the ground. All stakeholders are on the ground. And, and they are interested in privacy and security, but most in privacy and security outcomes, results. And if you think about privacy in clouds, then you have to be prepared to go beyond the traditional thinking about availability, continuity, integrity, and confidentiality. Because it's, it's also about which data should be collected, which should be retained, exchanged, who should have access to this, etc. And this is why we are now increasingly talking about privacy by design, because you can only do this and have a good result if you take this on board from the very beginning. So that's important. In terms of which results should be accomplished, that depends on the expectations of clients, but also depends on the rules which apply. And there we have a pretty good starting point in Europe now, because the, the rules which we have at present apply in the context of the activities of any establishment in Europe and wherever the data go, in whatever cloud, wherever the cloud may be. The problem is that we have 27 versions of these rules. So the new proposal is going to simplify this and is also going to clarify the extent to which these rules apply. The point just mentioned will continue to be the case but it will also apply in the context of an establishment of a processor. You know, this is also a relevant party. And, and it will also apply when services, goods and services are offered to the European market and when Europeans are being monitored. Now, this will pretty much cover all the relevant issues on the internet. 
The next question then is who's going to deliver protection, security, and privacy? And then it depends on whether you are a controller or a processor. Typically, a cloud provider starts out to be a processor only, it means following instructions of the controller. But, but more and more, we see that, that part of the share of the responsibility is also at the processor. Well, this will mean that they will have a heavier responsibility in delivering security and privacy. And the regulation will make them do that. And part of that is that they also need to clarify who is doing what. So the contracts between con controllers and processors need to be clear, specific. And if there is a co-responsibility, you have to specify <coughs> who is responsible for what. Next is then the question of accountability. That's an issue which will be emphasized. Responsibility and showing that all measures have been taken, demonstrating results, demonstrating effectiveness of results. And the regulation is to emphasize this a lot. Now, this means that the discussion between users of cloud services and providers of services will be much more interesting than so far. There is a lot of you take it or leave it kind of approach. I think in the future, the stakes are so clear that we need to be much more specific. And we need to be looking at how we can verify that these services are provided under terms which are acceptable. Because the results matter, you know, you need to demonstrate that everything has been done. So this conversation really needs to be much more dynamic. Assuming that both parties have the capacity to have a good conversation. Now, if you are a consumer uploading your data on the net, there is not much of conversation. In fact, these data may be very private and used private only. And, and then the provider is still under responsibilities to assure all the safety in reality, in outcomes. And the regulation will have the instruments to deliver the results and to measure and to enforce. There will be stronger liabilities, which can be also be acted on by organizations on behalf of their clients, their members, consumer organizations, and so forth. And there will be regulatory authorities to keep some discipline in the class if that is necessary. But I think the interest in delivering good results will be so dominant that there will be also incentives in the marketplace to take this on board. It means you will be discussing in the future not only the attractive business propositions, but also the consequences of building privacy and security in. And I'm looking forward to these results. I'd like to see a privacy by design data center. I'd like to see the audit results. There's going to be fantastic, interesting environment. Thank you. Very much to Peter Hastings. He raised some very important issues about the standardization of, uh, of agreements, including, uh, uh, I hope, service level agreements and end user agreements that are important for using the cloud. Uh, now we shall uh, move to our last speaker for the, uh, for the panel. This is uh, Thomas uh, Andres. Uh, he's uh, Chief Information Officer of Lufthansa. When we talk about Lufthansa, cloud is something which is very much linked to an airline company, but I guess you have another point of view on that. <laughs> Well, first of all, I have to apologize a bit. I wasn't stuck in the cloud. I was a mixture of um, strike in Frankfurt and traffic jam in Brussels. But anyways, I'm happy to be here. Um, looking at the cloud topic, I think it's extremely relevant. We believe we as a CIO, so I'm talking on not now just uh, not only Lufthansa, I'm talking on behalf of the professional users' perspective, the CIOs. We believe cloud is relevant. We believe cloud has a huge future. The technology is there. And I think there's a lot to come on that. At the same time, not too many of the cloud services are used yet because there is pretty much risks in there and there needs some topics to be dissolved. And you, your comment on the old laws and the old regulations to apply in whole, this does not match our reality. Um, the data protection thing is, a, a, we believe, a very good approach to harmonize and to put things on a, on a, on a um, um, sort of shared agenda and, and bringing things in a, 
in a situation where, where topics are similar, this is, this is a very good approach. But at the same time, at the moment, sometimes cloud is discussed like an extended version of outsourcing. But this is not the case. Cloud services will be extremely strong in combining services between companies, between uh, service offers, and the real strength of cloud computing will be there when we start to combine business models rather than doing classic outsourcing a bit smarter than in the past. So it's a completely new, new, new dimension on that. The next thing is uh, putting it on a, on a very practical basis. Uh, it's very interesting how to get in a cloud in a cloud-based service, and the very relevant topic is how to get out there again. Sometimes it's very easy to be in, but how to get out there again, and this has a dimension of, of um, kind of personal data and personal data protection on that, but at the same time, please keep in mind, companies are data. Modern companies are data. You use the example on, on uh, flight planning and things like that. It's very close to optimizers, very close to how, how you run your business model. It's very close to how much intelligence uh, will, will be in there in the way you, you run the data. So when we're talking about what can be put into cloud-based services, technologically speaking, a lot. And the mobile aspects and global reach is a beautiful thing. At the same time, we have to be clear about what should be in there and how to get it out again and what is our core, uh, the, the core in, in, in our company's um, context. I think this, this is extremely relevant. With regard to data protection specifically, we handed over information and Nelly Cross got letters from us and, and uh, Mr. Zimmermann, has, uh, we had very nice discussions on that, <coughs> very, very helpful on that. Things like choosing regions because there is regional compliance. We cannot ignore regions. And the concept to, to create Europe as a trusted environment for these type of service, we appreciate very much. Uh, having things like encryption in place to make sure who's seeing what kind of data would be absolutely um, brilliant on that. Um, so there's a lot of things where you can enhance growth. Um, oh, we don't need it. Um, we, where we can enhance uh, growth, these kind of things, and um, it's for us as the, as the professional users at the same time for every professional provider on that. If you look at this slide, which is shown now, uh, the data protection obligations is a very, very interesting part of the story. Um, look, at, look at the concept. If we, if we as a professional user use cloud services, we act more or less in the role of the controller in, in the concept of, of data protection. This could end up in an alien situation. Like, I'm a big user being the controller this, and making clear instructions how my process should look like. Next colleague is doing the same, but slightly different requests towards the process. Next provider and next user is the same. You will never be able to produce with this contradictory, strange and, and um, impossible to align kind of expectations from, from customers. We have to do that because we are in a classical interpretation of a controller role like data, pro uh, um, data processing on behalf. This brings us in a situation where we have to request from professional cloud users, uh, whoever this, this may be, that they have to follow our instructions on a detail level because we keep responsibility, we keep liability on the users, on the professional user side. This is the concept of data processing on behalf. So at this point, we need a, a very smart, slight shift in the logic, in the mechanics of how we deal with liability and, and roles on that. Um, the easy, straightforward concept is Shared data, shared responsibility. When I hand over my data to somebody who's promising to do something which is compliant, is doing something which is regional compliant maybe as a product, is compliant to a contract we have, then this somebody provider on a very professional basis has to be liable and responsible for, for what he is doing with the data he, he got from, from his customer. Shared data, handing into a cloud, shared responsibility so we can uh, sort of do our professional job, we as an enterprise customers are considering what should be put into cloud-based services and professional providers um, which sort of install their own business model, their own delivery and do it on a very professional way, get the stamps like compliant or compliant to some region or compliant to some security level like you said, which is a brilliant, brilliant approach to, to need-driven security de uh, depending on the type of topic. So this is the point where we need a slight adjustment on the concepts of the past, which is data protection on behalf. And by the way, almost every data has a connect to uh, personal 
because it's log files doing, it's behavioral, it's, it's like profiling, so it's getting very close, very, very quickly close to personal data. But we need this, this shift between um, if somebody is taking data, sharing data, has to lead to shared responsibility, is leading to freedom in the way somebody is designing his processes. We don't have to, to hit uh, professional cloud providers with impossible instructions which, which hinder industrialized and smart production in, in big scale. This is, I think, a very important point. And if we get this, this right in Europe, I think it would be a big breakthrough for us, which brings us in a position to use cloud-based service for much more topics than today, and maybe for, for European community as a, as a whole to be a very smart and thought through a place to, to use modern modern based services. I think this could be a real step forward. We are looking forward. We believe that this is a, a good approach. This will be extremely relevant for small and medium uh, enterprise at the moment and will become more relevant for the bigger ones because it's not outsourcing. It's much more than that when we, once we combine services which lead to business models and uh, which lead to processes which never had been there before. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Thomas Andres. Uh, we have uh, uh, um, heard a very interesting panel. I think that you are going to agree. Uh, uh, five people that are very knowledgeable about, uh, about cl cloud and uh, the technological solutions are there. Uh, the legal uh, and the law enforcement uh, actions are on the way. I think that we've got uh, quite a lot of answers and uh, less questions, which is a very good thing for, uh, for a new area as cloud computing. Uh, since we are running behind the schedule, I would uh, still uh, ask uh, or uh, suggest to uh, allow two or three questions uh, if they are very concrete. Uh, if you uh, would like to ask uh, somebody particular from the panel, it's going to be even better. And then we close the panel. You have the floor, and then uh, you, please. Thank you very much. Eric Pigal, uh, European IT consultant, member of the European Economic and Social Committee, and rapporteur on cloud computing in Europe. Um, I do agree with you, it's more than outsourcing still. The general public is very much concerned about having data outside uh, our house or organization. Um, it's also using internet as the tube to communicate between the cloud center and myself. Fine, e-banking, e-commerce, we've been using internet for decades and this is not new with cloud computing. Something new. Server virtualization, more specifically for cloud computing. What about security, about uh, mutualization? Uh, I would like to get the vision of the panelists on this perspective and maybe also cross-border, but it's quite a common issue. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll get the questions and then I would, uh, I would ask the panelists to, to, to close. So please, sir. Thank you. Alfredo Tebal, uh, head of Brussels office, uh, Telefonica. I was uh, taken by, by the comment of the uh, European uh, data supervisor, Peter Hustings, on we're talking about the cloud, but everything is on the ground. Now, I was thinking about, about networks. Networks are also on the ground, and base stations are also on the ground. Um, we heard a previous panelist saying that um, customers would be basically be um, transferring files of 150 gigabytes from place to place, uh, and this perhaps adds to the complexity of the cloud, which also has a component uh, of investment. Um, we need to talk about uh, investment and how to promote investment in Europe to enable cl uh, cloud services. I wonder what the panel thinks about that. And if I may, a second question perhaps to our American colleague. Uh, we heard Vice President Redding many a times saying that uh, we have a golden opportunity for a transatlantic agreement on data protection. Um, because if we don't get it right this time, it might be that we have to discuss with other areas of the world in the future. I wonder what your view is of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask then the panelists to, uh, for the closing remarks. So we have the questions about mutualization, we have the questions about investments, and we have the questions about uh, uh, personal data and uh, transatlantic uh, relations. I'll give you a microphone. <coughs> Um, I have emphasized uh, the word results and spoke about results on the ground of real people. Um, just avoid all the legalese because it's all about results. 
Um, and this is why I think it's important to uh, create a framework which ensures predictability so that all the stakes are on the table and everybody knows what the consequences will be. So reduce uncertainty. This is not so easy in, in a cloud environment, but it, this is still important. And then organize, uh, sort of distribute the stakes, the incentives. Well, this is about who is responsible for what. And there I can follow my neighbor's comment that a cloud provider will have some responsibility. <coughs> And of course, you need to clarify who is responsible for what. But I do not buy in to his idea that the liability should then shift, and he didn't say exclusively, but this may be the consequence. I think that, to make this very personal, that Lufthansa continues to be responsible for its clients. And if I fly with Lufthansa, I would expect them to be responsible and continue to be responsible. Now, if they use cloud services, the cloud service provider should also be responsible, but still Lufthansa will be my interface. So we are building responsibility chains. That's nothing new in this world, but this will now become an evident thing. And we will see the incentives to clarify this, organize quality and change. Data protection, like anything else. And the proposal is doing exactly this. It will recognize the responsibility <coughs> of all the actors. And that's good. That creates the stakes clear on the table. And then the rest is those responsible should be delivering the results. They should not be coming to regulators to ask, what should we do? They are responsible for delivering compliance. And if they don't do it, regulators will intervene. Thank you very much. I'm um, going to, to answer that, I guess, yeah, but also just, the questions that uh, you might ask. Just, just to add on that, um, I, I like the, the approach you're, you're describing. It's shared responsibility. It's not handed over responsibility and ignoring after. It's shared responsibility in terms of a, a process chain. The overall decision for sure has to stay with the company who owns the data and, and sources them out to, to a partner. This is clear. At the same time, the part of the process which is done by somebody else should be done by this somebody else on a very professional basis with own li liability being part of a value chain and not like today um, the, the, uh, the um, uh, customer company is sort of staying responsibly, responsible and has to audit and find mistakes by themselves and the other party has no responsibility at all. That's a bit un in unbalance today and driven by concepts of the past. I just, I'm, so it's shared, not, not handed over and ignored. Uh, clear, this shared data concept. Um, to react a little bit on the virtualization thing, I'm not sure I got it exactly right, but uh, some, some slight comments. Virtualization, we like it. It's a good technology. You can do a lot of things in there. Uh, you have to be smart when you put on virtualized basis uh, regionalized concepts, like regional compliance services based on that. So there is a bit thinking needed. But uh, um, the general opportunity with virtualized concept is also increasing security because the data can be at one uh, place which you know, where you can uh, make up your mind. The decentral data of the past, where the data are everywhere, and you never know where they are, where they are located in terms of decentral storage at devices all over the place, is, has own risks in terms of where are the data, where do you find them, where are copies from. Thinking it big on a virtualized basis is giving you a significant additional chance to get a clear concept where which data should be located and how to handle them in a proper way uh, uh, to the extent of administration rights and all these things. So there is some risks in there due to the fact that the virtualization concepts are so strong, but the part of the concept is increased security because the data are more or less at a central point uh, which you can do a lot of smart concepts around. Thank you very much, Paul Nemitz. Yes, uh, on the question of investment, of course, uh, as a lawyer, I, I don't know whether investment is necessary uh, to make the cloud work. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like probably yes, uh, given the mass of data and the speed of movement uh, you may be requiring. Um, and as I said before, we believe we are creating ideal conditions in Europe uh, uh, for investors in cloud hardware. 
uh, to be sure that uh, the regulatory environment is such that they can uh, make the choices they, they need to make with their partners in a stable environment and that they can also uh, tell to their customers that uh, it's not only a promise they make as a company, but it is actually a promise of a regulatory regime with independent supervisors, uh, with effective uh, dissuasive uh, uh, sanctions, uh, which ensures that um, uh, the services which are provided from uh, these hardware investments um, uh, fulfill uh, the promises and, and the standards of, of protection uh, of privacy and, and individual data which uh, people today uh, um, 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 expect. Uh, so um, I think we are um, putting down a framework for the future which will clarify things but uh, which also leaves uh, some aspects uh, to be dealt with uh, uh, by, by, by controllers and uh, um, 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 processors together. Uh, uh, I don't think that uh, we want to have a straitjacket where everything is predetermined in statutory law. Uh, uh, I don't think that's uh, um, the function of uh, um, 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 our, our proposal. I think it is the right balance between uh, making clear what is necessary to be made clear now in the public uh, interest on the one hand, but also on the other hand, leaving um, to uh, individuals, to processors and to controllers the choices which they have to have. And in terms of liability, to come back to this question, uh, the issue is of course liability for what and towards whom exactly. And also in this relationship, uh, choices have to be possible uh, uh, with, within the law. Um, so I think we are not providing for a straitjacket here, but we are providing for um, um, uh, an optimized concordance of on the one hand what individuals uh, expect in terms of protection so that they can trust uh, the environment and hand on their data and on the other hand what businesses need uh, to thrive uh, and to develop in Europe and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric Hübner. So uh, I'm, I'm tempted to give a long answer but I'm supposed oh, to, especially <laughs> a virtualization of course, what, what you mentioned. Uh, that in cloud, cloud computing indeed is a very important topic uh, you just got to know your threats, definitely. When you, when you deal with it professionally, just know your threats. Uh, when something is built in software, it uh, can be attacked by software, by human beings. Um, so what you have to do is just investigate what, what you're building there. So like all complex systems, and virtualization adds to complexity, makes, makes it much harder to, to manage security which also means that you have to put much more effort into knowing your threats, do threat modeling, and, and make sure you, you mitigate uh, the threats the right way. Um, so it's, it's very hard to mathematically prove that there is no vulnerability or architectural issue whatsoever in the vir virtualization tool you, tool you use. That's, um, that's the given fact. So what you have to do is just know your stuff very well. And it's not only virtualization. So if you virtualize your environments, you also have to manage your, your management environment you use to manage virtualization. So it, it adds a lot of complexity. That's true, but well, professional people who, who deal with this kind of stuff know about it and have the right mitigations in place on several levels, from the network to the application. You have to always look at the whole stack and view these problems in a holistic way. Uh, one more small comment. You just reminded me. Yes, that's right. 30 years ago, I was a lawyer as well. Yes. So what, what I think about shared liability here is, first, we should ask the question of attribution. Who is responsible for what? And afterwards, we might have a discussion about liability. But attribution, I think, is, is more important. Who is responsible for what? Liability will be solved very easily then. Thank you very much, Jan Bergman. You, you had a question to your, to your personality also. Yes, uh, I definitely agree that there, there is a good moment in time now for transatlantic progress on these issues. And there was an interesting discussion last night, actually, that Peter Hustings was part of on data privacy. And, and as uh, I think one point uh, you noted, Peter, is that I think there is an increasing convergence in the views on data privacy and security in the US and Europe. So we're moving closer together on, on the principles and the, the core values that we're trying to protect. I think there's sometimes disagreement on how we accomplish that, but I think it's really important that we work together to solve these issues. Uh, a second point is that we're hearing from our customers, including 
traditional brick and mortar customers that they want us to get these issues solved. They want to be able to transfer the data between the US and, and Europe. So it's very important to us uh, and, uh, because we're hearing about it from our customers. And then I think the third strategic point that Ms. Redding raised is very important as well, which is the longer um, this issue is, is not uh, truly addressed, the more we're going to have other parts of the world, uh, such as Asia and China exerting a great influence on these issues. So it really is in our strategic interest to work together to set the right model and to allow the, uh, the core foundation of where we agree to, to set the framework for uh, cross-border data around the world. So. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I think that uh, you are uh, all sharing my, my impression that we had uh, an excellent panel with uh, uh, very good ideas and uh, very much food for thought afterwards, but uh, I think I'm much more optimistic about cloud computing in Europe than I was before the beginning of that panel. Hopefully, everybody's. Let's give an applause to our panel.